Great. So we're pleased to have Arnon Tripathi, who's newly, again, from uh, Stanford University, who will tell us about line bundles in equivariant elliptic cohomology over the complex numbers with Dan Berwick Evans. Cool. All right. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be talking in this venue. Uh, it's very exciting. I want to see what happens in the Discord chat afterwards. I have a little question here that I posed as a pre-talk question, which usually I would have up in the corner of the board and if this were a board talk. Uh, let me just read it out here in case you want something to chew on while I go over some of the definitions, if you happen to already know the definitions. So we're all experts at stacks here, post 1990 or something. We're supposed to be as comfortable with them as we are with schemes. <laughs> Uh, and I thought I was an expert with stacks too. I'd manipulate them just as easily as I did uh, schemes or algebraic spaces. Uh, but this question gave me some trouble. So uh, you take a crack at it. I'm interested to see what you think. Suppose I have two global quotient stacks, X mod G and Y mod H, where X and Y are schemes or algebraic spaces might be a little bit more natural. And G and H are linear algebraic groups acting on X and Y. And let's say that a map of stacks between them is of a particularly special sort, an equivariant map, if it arises from the datum of a homomorphism of linear algebraic groups, rho from G to H, and a G equivariant morphism from X to Y, where G acts on Y via its morphism to H. So if I have this datum, that definitely gives me a map of global quotient stacks. And certainly not every map of global quotient stacks arises in this particularly simple way. But can you always factor every map of global quotient stacks as a span of these equivariant maps where by a span, I mean that we've got some guy sitting in the middle, and an arrow to the left, an arrow to the right. Both maps are equivariant, i.e. of the simple sort. And the left map is an equivalence of stacks. And I think my Discord is beeping, so let me make sure I've muted that or just close it. Great. OK. All right, so there you go. That's something to entertain yourself if you like. Let me get to the topic of the talk, which is line bundles and equivariant elliptic cohomology over the complex numbers. And as Ravi mentioned in his introduction, this is all joint work with Dan Berwick Evans. So if you ever see attributions B, E, dash T, that's the two of us. So typically I would, when I give talks on this subject, I motivate it a great deal. And I've got so much content this time that I'm going to woefully skip most of the motivation. Please do ask questions uh, during the talk or at the end of the talk about why I'm doing certain things and why it's interesting to care about those things. But for the most part, I'm going to leave those to just verbal comments. So that being said, let's get into it and define some of the objects that are of interest here. So suppose G is a compact Lie group and it acts on some manifold M. Uh, so there's some finite type assumption here, which just to be technically accurate means that M G equivariantly embeds in a finite dimensional G representation. Then a definition due to Gronowski, and maybe there's a slight gloss due to the two of us, there's an epsilon at most, is that you can define this interesting sheaf called the G equivariant elliptic cohomology of M as some sheaf over bun G E. So if I need to give you this definition, let's first discuss what this scheme is. So here, E is an elliptic curve over the complex numbers. Or if you like, you can take it to be a family of elliptic curves. And I'm perfectly happy with you taking it to be the global universal elliptic curve over the moduli of elliptic curves. Typically, in this talk, for simplicity, I'll write and think about E as just a fixed elliptic curve over C, but everything works uh, globally. Then this bungee E is supposed to reflect the moduli of G bundles on E, on that elliptic curve or on that family of elliptic curves. And there are essentially two different ways to view this object. On the left-hand side of these two columns that you see are going to come up in this talk is something more real geometry. I labeled it differential geometry. And on the right-hand side is more holomorphic or algebraic geometry. And the fact that we've got this cool equivalence between these two different ways of seeing this guy is uh, due to Narasimhan and Sashadri and then further developments afterwards. So, OK, let's just start with an algebra geometric definition. Let's consider the moduli of semi-stable GC bundles on E, where GC is the complex reductive group given by complexifying the compact Lie group G. If you don't know what semi-stable means, and I'm not sure I know what it means for general G, although I could probably figure it out, don't worry about it. There's also a technical. I was gonna ask you about that, but not because I wanna know what it means. I just, why, why is that there? Like, why, who cares? Uh, that's gonna matter for you? That, do we need to ask you what it means or can we just throw it out and just say bund all bundles? <laughs> Uh, this is a great question. That was, that was my, 
Because <laughs> I was like, I asked serious questions too. That was it. No, well, okay. So one reason why that's there is to make this correspondence hold. There's something going on on the left side, and it's not going to correspond to the right side unless I put this uh, this thing in place. I mean, okay. In one sense, you already know the answer to this question. This correspondence is GIT. It's an infinite dimensional version of GIT, and that's the reason why stability is going on on the right-hand side. I could drop it on the right-hand side and attempt to work over the stack where I don't take a GIT quotient, but then something really weird happens where I don't actually get a sheaf on my stack. I only get a sheaf on kind of a coarse moduli space thereof. And if I want to- so, so it's a feature, not a bug. Yeah, actually, it's on purpose to get an actual, to avoid, okay. So it's actually there not for, it's actually there for a reason, not just for intellectual comfort. That's right. and. Uh, this has been something that I've struggled with, and I, I'm not sure why this object that I'm going to define for you is naturally defined over the coarse moduli space rather than the stack. I believe it's probably because it naturally comes from this side of the world, and I force it to be an algebraic geometry. Uh, I, I don't have a great answer to this question, but I do want to work with this coarse moduli space. So, okay, so this is something, which is an algebraic uh, moduli problem, and I'm going to Take a, okay, so it has a whole bunch of connected components. You can check that pi zero, the connected components of this guy is naturally in bijection with the uh, dealing group pi one of G. And let me just take a couple smaller things. So inside there, I could consider the components corresponding to the torsion subgroup of pi one of G. And inside there, I could consider the, cor uh, the single connected component corresponding to just zero inside pi one G. And here I've written down the correspondence to the left-hand side. If I restrict to these torsion components, then this, so, so to speak, differential geometric picture tells me that I need to be looking at flat G bundles on my elliptic curve E, or equivalently by Riemann Hilbert, pairs of commuting elements mod conjugates. And if I restrict further, then again, there's something on the left hand side where I add an extra condition. One way to say this condition is that my pair of commuting elements may be simultaneously conjugated into a maximum torus. Okay. And all right, so there's a question, you know, there's probably something that you could fill in here, and there is, and it's just not going to matter so much, so I'm going to skip it. So for this talk, uh, by bungee E, I'm just going to mean this last simplest thing. Everything works fine at this middle level, and probably you could go up to the top level, but let me not focus on that for simplicity. The single connected component will do as well. Okay, so now I, now I have this algebraic, uh, well, it's a, it's a scheme, it's naturally a projective scheme. Uh, unless you're working globally or, you know, it, it's a projective scheme over the base. And I wanted to find some sheaf on here. So let me go ahead and do that. So first of all, I'm actually going to define this sheaf as a sheaf on its analytification. And then later I'll be like, okay, secretly this guy actually came from some algebraic quasi coherent sheaf. So here it is. I'll define this stockwise, the stocks at some point little g, where little g, I'm using this notation right here of a pair of commuting elements in capital G. I'll define as the following object. It's going to be this ring. It's the equivariant cohomology of my manifold M with respect to the group G acting on it. Actually, Arnav, I have a dangerous question. Or is your, because I don't want to slow this down, but you, are your, is your, are your notes around as a PDF that you could share with everyone in advance, or is it better not to? because you have a big surprise at the end where you prove the Hodge conjecture. Uh, I don't have the notes as a PDF in, in advance, but I could just maybe save this file and- upload sure, it. after. Yep, tomorrow's good. Yeah, it sounds great. Oh, okay, sure. So whenever the people want to go back and see stuff. Great, good. Okay, right. So I want to consider the equivariant cohomology of M with respect to G, but I'm doing something a little bit trickier here. So here by M super G, I mean the fixed locus of M under the action of little g inside uh, capital G. So in other words, the fixed locus of this pair of commuting elements. Uh, I mean the same thing by G super G, where by the action on G, I mean the adjoint action. So equivalently the common centralizer of this pair of commuting elements. You can check that this subgroup still acts on this submanifold right here. And I want to consider its equivariant cohomology. Okay, actually now I have to, uh, now I have to stop and ask. So, okay, to, to make sure I understand where things were and this may require going back, You've got G, you're looking for G bundles on, so you fix your elliptic curve. You have one elliptic curve E through it. You have your, uh, you have your G bundles on it. Which G bundles? They're gonna be semi-stable. Let's not worry exactly what that means, but they're gonna be nice and generic ones uh, for now. So you can have a reasonable space of such things to have 
the space loading be projective or maybe quasi projective. I'm not sure because you're throwing out more stuff. No, oh, even projective. Okay. So, you, uh, and the problem with it being projective is you've got these potentially strictly semi stable points, but maybe I won't worry about that. I'll pretend everything is smooth. Is that that's a, okay for so far to say? Uh, okay. Uh, for now, I'll say that. Uh, and then you're going to have a bundle on it. Uh, and that's where I'm going to put either everything, it's an honest moduli space, in which case it'll be some. Uh, universal bundle, or if it's strictly semi-stable, there's something you did to make there be a bundle on it. That, am I okay so far? And then somehow you picked a G1, G2. That's where you picked a G equals G1, G2. Uh, and now what happened there? You just picked some random G1, G2, or that's like a random point of your module on space. So, okay, good. So, right. We have this space of bungee. That's a projective scheme or some guy with a map down to whatever the base is, M elliptic, if you like, M11, and that's a projective. Okay, that's fixed. That's just sitting there. I now want to define a sheaf on this object. Ah, and you're telling me point by point because that's right. Point, uh, so you're identifying this moduli space. You're saying this module, not moduli space, is nothing more than two elements of our group G1 comma G2, which are somewhat, I'm guessing, going to be the monodromy around our two loops and the torus around our two loops and torus. Uh, and it's a maximal torus, which is good because they're supposed to commute. Like you go around the tor the elliptic curve is high one is commutative. So that, that's what you're saying so far. So the data of these bundles is the same as just tell me the monodromy around these two loops. And now you're going to, to uh, now you're going to tell me the fiber over each point. Uh, that's so right. I think that's I'm happy. Right. People should also feel asking dumb, like, yeah. Uh, if I feel asking these questions, other people should feel asking, like, don't feel asking these questions too, just so I don't feel like the only. Let me just resummarize again. Uh, it may or may not be helpful. I've got this space bungee E, and I wanted to find a sheaf on it. I'm going to define that sheaf point by point. I'm going to give you the stocks of this sheaf. This guy's my sheaf that I'm trying to define. I'm going to give you those stocks point by point. Uh, and then I'm going to say they glue together in some way to an actual sheaf. So I need to talk about the points of this guy. What are the points? And here I literally mean the points over C of this complex scheme. By this correspondence up here, they correspond to pairs of commuting elements mod sum equivalents given by simultaneous conjugation. In other words, it suffices for me to give you the stocks at each pair of commuting elements, which represents a point on this space, bungee E, and then I'm going to have all these stocks of my sheaf that hopefully glue together. Is that reasonable? Cool. So in particular, this guy is supposed to be some stock of some sheaf. It needs to be a module over whatever the stock of the structure sheaf of this guy is at that pair little g corresponding to the pair of commuting elements that labels my, uh, my actual g bundle on my elliptic curve. So, so far I've just said, here's some thing, it's a vector space that I've written down and I haven't defined it for you yet. Uh, I'll say a couple words about bivec covariant cohomology is, but it's just a vector space. I need to make sure that it's a module over whatever the stock of the structure sheaf of bungee E is at that pair of commuting elements. I claim that the, that the stock of the structure sheaf of bungee E at that pair of commuting elements is precisely the G super G equivariant cohomology of a point as well. So, okay. G, what is G super G? Uh, good, so G super G is the simultaneous centralizer of G1 and G2. The elements of our group, which fix, but I've got to remember my group theory, fix both G1, that commute with G1 and G2. That's right. Okay. So this statement, once you parse it, it's not terrible to figure out what's going on or anything, but I mostly want to skip this uh, parsing. I, I mostly want to tell you what this equivariant cohomology is give you some idea of what's going on. What are these vector spaces that I'm constructing? And then I want to do a couple examples so that we can see what is going on as opposed to just this abstract definition. Is that fair? Cool. Okay. So let me define for you the equivariant G equivariant cohomology of a G manifold M. And here I'll use kind of a DRAM approach. Usually the cohomology of the manifold M, well, one way to compute it is to write the complex of DRAM forms, differential forms, and take the cohomology of that. If I have a G action on M, there's something very cool that Carton discovered where I could consider this complex, namely smooth functions on the complexified Lie algebra 
that are valued inside differential forms on N, G naturally acts on both the source and the target. It acts on the source by the adjoint action and it acts on the target by its action on N. I could demand some G invariance there. And there's some natural differential called the Carton differential, which is basically the Durham differential, but with a little added bonus that I won't spell out right now. This complex computes uh, something that I might call the equivariant cohomology of M with respect to G. And let me go back up here now. Uh, in the midst of this, I see that I forgot to define one other piece of notation that I'll come back to. But let me go back up here now. So now the G super G equivariant cohomology of a point, uh, let's just specialize this thing, this definition to M being a point. You see that I'm just studying G equivariant or G invariant functions on the complexified Lie algebra. So in other words, if I took spec of this guy, so this is going to be some kind of ring. If I want to think about spec of it as giving me some little piece of a space that I'm gonna to try to glue together, spec of G, C, G invariance, i.e. what I might, and okay. So here I'm doing C infinity of G, C, and there's some adjectives here as well. Let me, instead of doing C infinity functions, consider polynomial functions. And I'll talk a little bit later. You can see this remark in pink about the difference. Spec of polynomial functions on GC, G invariance is GC, course quotient by G, which is also the maximal torus, course quotient by a vial group. And I claim that this maximal torus, course quotient by a vial group, is exactly the local structure of this moduli space of G bundles on an elliptic curve. So that connects together part of the story. And I'm actually going to skip now, I think, this discussion about the difference between polynomials and holomorphic functions, unless someone has questions. I'll say that that's. So I'm not going to ask questions about that. <laughs> but I mean, the answer is it just works and don't worry about it, I guess. But the, uh, but the thing I would do want to ask questions about is you're taking, you know, like, is the, the specs. Presumably, if you do everything equivalently like, over the strictly over the semi-stable points, like, I'm going to keep coming back to the why not work on the full moduli stack rather than this. And I'm guessing your answer would be everything works just fine. And for simplicity, you'll just talk about the corresponding space rather than the stack. Surprisingly, no. Uh, this sheaf elliptic GM does not have a life over the moduli stack except in some very some silly way is just pulled back from the course moduli space. Really, so uh, it's not, you can't just take this cart, you have to pay attention to what this is. You make a, because your definition now was in terms of, I have to parse this carton uh, description is you have this complex and that complex looks like it is a happy complex anyway. And I guess here I'm taking your spaces, you defined it as, or you had your uh, capital G superscript little g as little g1 comma little g2, so that they commute with each other and span a maximal torus. And then the slight generalization, if you wanted to go outside of this set stable locus, would presumably be how they commute with each other. And just don't worry about them spanning stuff, uh, uh, I'm guessing, because that, that'd be like you're, you just get a bundle. Uh, and then just do everything without worrying. Like you never are using that they're spanning a maximal torus and do everything else on this space. Uh, and, uh, but now you're telling me something funny is gonna happen. Okay, let, let me recall just a couple of things just to make sure we're on the same page. I think you're talking about this condition right here, which picks out one component of the moduli space on GE, and the components of the course space and of the stack are the same. So that, that's its own discussion, irrelevantly, irre, irrespective of whether you'd like to talk about the space or the stack. And here the condition was that they may simultaneously be conjugated into a maximal torus. That's the condition that picks out the kind of trivial component of the space, i.e. the component containing the trivial bundle. But you're not labeling the torus that they're conjugated into. It can no, if they can be conjugated into a maximal torus, they could be conjugated into any maximal torus. Good point, right. <laughs> okay. So that's its own condition. And it's certainly worthwhile to ask, can I extend my definition of the sheaf away from just this component to some of the other components as well? And that I can certainly do over the course space. Now there's a different question. Can I extend it to over the stack? And there are two questions there. One is that 
even the core space, you can do a GIT stack where you restrict to the polystable or semi-stable locus and take a stacky quotient by the group action instead of taking a core space. And that's already an extension. And then you could try to do a further extension where you don't even restrict to the semi-stable locus. Even that first step, I don't know how to do. And I don't think I, I don't think it should be done. I suspect that there's no natural way to upgrade this structure right here, which is naturally a module over this core space. I don't see a way to upgrade it to something with a natural equivariant structure over this space. Great. So Great. That's, I, that's I think this is really a feature. Great, thanks. I'm sorry to slow you so, down, that was helpful. Arnav, I, I came in a little bit late, so I apologize if this was just sort of baked into the very beginning. Um, but what is M here? Like what the, the definition L, G, M, what are we after defining? What is M? M is some G manifold that satisfies some technical finite type hypothesis. And okay. essentially what I'm trying to define for you is a variant of the equivariant cohomology, the G equivariant cohomology of M, but it's made elliptic in some way. And this whole okay. discussion is what the heck does that made elliptic mean? And for right. some reason, the answer is a sheaf on a scheme, which is why it needs algebraic geometry tools to start attacking questions here. Okay, thanks. Okay, so great. Uh, I've defined some, I've defined the, the stocks of some sheaf. I've pretended that they glue together to some actual global sheaf over the space, and I'm not going to describe that. And let's pretend now that we actually get some sheaf called elliptic GM over the space on GE. Let's do some examples. So let's start with the example of G equals U of one, or if you prefer talking about its complexification GM, acting on a point. Okay, so first of all, let's just figure out what the underlying space over which all of this is supposed to be happening is. Bungie, oh, I'm, I've already switched to complex notation. Bungie M of E, I mean, the moduli of rank one line bundles on E, is also known as the dual abelian dual elliptic curve of E, which happens to be canonically isomorphic to E itself, if you like. So what is this guy just, you know, just to get some feeling of what this is as a space, it's an elliptic curve. It's the same elliptic curve that I started with. And the claim is that this is some complex geometry way of writing something that's also differential geometric. And by the way, uh, there's no semi-stable thing to worry about here. We're, we're fine, it's all fine. Uh, over on the left-hand side, one way to describe these, oh, sorry, and I'm restricting to uh, turn number, yeah, I'm sorry, degree zero bundles when I said I'm only considering one component. So over on the left-hand side, these degree zero bundles may equivalently be given flat structure so I have a flat U1 bundle over E. And that corresponds, as Ravi said, to taking the monodromy around the pair of loops in E, i.e. I get exactly two elements of U of one that commute. I'm not going to bother writing that condition. Mod conjugacy, and I shouldn't really have bothered writing that condition. So in other words, I'm labeling the points of my dual elliptic curve over my elliptic curve by these pairs of commuting elements in U of one. I, essentially what I'm doing is I'm choosing some uniformization of my elliptic curve and writing this, if you like, as something like Z C mod Z plus Z tau. And my two elements of U of one, I'm picking logarithms for them and writing them as two copies of R inside C. And the fact that they're in U of one rather than in R, yeah, cool, uh, gives me that it naturally maps not to C, but to C mod some lattice inside there. Okay, so that, that's just the geometry. I just want you to have some idea of the space that we're over, which in this case is just an elliptic curve. And more generally, it's going to be a product of a whole bunch of the elliptic curve mod some finite group that should be thought of as some type of algorithm. It is some type of algorithm. So that's the space over which I'm trying to build something. And what am I actually doing here? Well, okay. In this case, the sheaf that I'm trying to build is supposed to be built out of a bunch of U1 equivariant cohomologies of a point. Okay, well, what is U of one equivariant cohomology of a point? This might be a computation that you've seen before when you previously learned equivariant cohomology, or you can scroll up to the definition I gave here. It's going to be the cohomology of some complex and the differential is not going to be interesting in this case. 
of, I told you C infinity should probably be replaced by just polynomial functions of over each point here, I'm supposed to be considering polynomial functions on the complexification of this Lie algebra. You just polynomial functions on C. So in other words, what's going on here is that I'm trying to build some sheaf, which is at each point of this space, I've got a copy of C and I'm trying to glue all of them together in some way to get a sheaf over this space. And I haven't spelled out the gluing for you, but you can imagine that what's happening is that the, these complex spaces should be identified with the tangent space of this elliptic curve at whatever point I'm at. And the way that they're being identified infinitesimally is by these little translations. So in other words, this is what, oh, okay. So sorry, the, the answer here is that I'm just going to get the structure sheet of this dual elliptic curve. And right, but I, I wanna back up a little bit. Really what, what I'm constructing here is I'm, I'm taking on these equivariant cohomologies, which are, kind of, which are kind of these nice friendly polynomial rings. So if I take spec of it, or if I, yeah, if I wanna think about it geometrically, I've got all these copies of just the affine line. And that would be the sort of structure that you get if you usually think about equivariant cohomology, but I'm doing this crazy thing where I glue them together, all these copies of the affine line, I'm gluing them together where I say the local, uh, the local ring of the affine line around zero is being identified with the local ring of the sheaf that I'm trying to build on this space. So I'm gluing together a whole bunch of these affine lines over this elliptic curve, and as a consequence, I'm getting the elliptic curve, but it's something very crazy from the perspective of taking equivariant cohomology and forcing the equivariant variables to be periodic in this way. So I'm not sure if that explanation was helpful. It's the way that I think about it but I also tried to give you a definition up here. So there's something. Wait, Arnav, just to, just, just to make sure. Um, so you specifically wanted to use polynomials rather than say power series or convergent power series for these sort of local models, even though, you know, for an elliptic curve, that, that sounds fishy now, but then you just said something that made me think maybe you really do want to do this because you're going to try and build some periodicity directly into those polynomial rings. Is that what you're doing? Like you're really quotienting? You're, you're yeah. absolutely right. Uh, one of the remarks in pink that I skipped up here is I'm trying to take analytic equivariant cohomology, by which I exactly mean take this guy, which is the module over the polynomials, and tensor it up with, as you like, either power series or you can just work with uh, the ring of holomorphic functions. Uh, you just analytify in the sense of, you know, okay, Gaga or whatever. All right, let me follow up on Jim's question because I'm still confused as to why you picked polynomials. I mean, are, are, are you, uh, it, it, it feels like you were saying, you're telling a different audience that, okay, what's an elliptic curve? It's a complex numbers module a lattice. So we'll try to think about the complex numbers and worry about gluing them. Whereas I would instead want to just work over the elliptic curve and not try to worry about that gluing. And then you'll just make a different definition without trying to make words about the gluing. Like, like, I feel like you're talking to the people on the differential geometric side, not the other. And that instead you'll just say, here's a definition, boom. Not, uh, and maybe that's going to be the next slide. Or okay, good. Yeah, let me give this remark in pink. Like it's, a, it's a good remark. So I'm trying to build some sheaf over bungee E. And it's going to be important to me that bungee E is an algebraic scheme and that bungee E is an algebraic coherent sheaf. Uh, because I'm going to want to do constructions later, which I feel comfortable with in algebraic geometry. If you really wanted to, you could talk about it in complex analytic geometry, but it's not quite as nice. So I want to build this sheaf as an algebraic sheaf. The problem is that the, I'm going, the way that I know how to build it is stock by stock. These stocks are naturally given as these equivariant cohomologies right here. The, so, so you really can't, you're not just, you're not just saying that, like you really can't build it globally. You really can only build it stock by stock. You're not just doing that to say, it's not like, just, like when you describe a vector bundle, you could say, here are the fibers, they're all vector space by vector space. And, oh, there's some way of gluing them together. In this case, you're saying you really can't immediately globally naturally do so yet. Or, that, that's exactly right. I don't know a good definition of this sheaf just perfectly within the framework of algebraic geometry like a priori. The way that Ranowski defined it in the 90s and the way that I'm explaining it now is you, he builds it stock by stock and you explain how to glue those together. And the natural structure, 
Go ahead. There's no there's no completion or something on that that you wanted to do. Like you you could imagine making those stocks by taking this vectors, you know, by completing something, so right. that you really are dealing with analytic functions or something. Exactly. So the natural structure on these stocks is they are modules of a polynomial ring. But that algebraic structure is not compatible with the algebraic structure that I eventually want, as you're saying. It, the natural algebraic structure here is that of C, i.e. the Lie algebra, uh, uh, yeah, the Lie algebra of my elliptic curve. That's not helpful to me. I want this other algebraic structure that knows about the elliptic curve as an algebraic scheme. So exactly as you're saying, what I need to do is I need to analytify both sides, or you could go further and take completed power series rings. And I'm going to analytify the equivariant cohomology and glue all those guys together to get a complex analytic sheet over the analytification of my elliptic curve. And then later I'll say, hey, by the way, that anal complex analytic sheet is the analytification of a coherent algebraic sheet over the algebraic scheme one G. That's it, so you're trapped over the complex numbers. Right now, you're not, this, you're not doing this over, you're not, yeah, okay. You're, it's like a fundamentally, great. okay. So it, it's worth commenting a few things. One is that this is somehow the most invariant definition that I know. There's an argument that I will give you, or at least verbally hint at eventually, as to why this actually comes from a coherent algebraic sheet. That argument could be used to just build this directly, but it's somehow not as invariant. So it, there's some sense of pick or poison, but okay, if you're willing to break some symmetry and do other things, you could do that. Let me start explaining some of that. Um, well, okay. Okay, well, okay. Well, let me give one more example because. I think examples will probably be more helpful than general definitions. So, all right, G acting on a point similarly, I was just going to go through a little explanation to get that I, again, get the structure sheet over this space on GE. But I want to do a more interesting example of U of one or GM acting on CP1 or S2. And this is this action by rotation. So here's CP1, and I'm going to consider the action Kind of standard action. And I want to calculate the equivariant elliptic cohomology of this guy. So whatever it is, it's going to be some sheaf living over this space, which as we've already noted, may be identified with a dual elliptic curve. Okay, what is it? So now, finally, I get to go back up and mention one other piece of notation that I dropped, which Jim also picked up on and alluded to, which is that I'm taking cohomology not with coefficients in C, but in this slight extension where this beta is a formal variable of degree two, or minus two. In other words, the effect of what's going on here is exactly to two periodize cohomology. And that's useful and important, but I'm not going to comment on it further as to why it's useful and important. But what that does for us here is, okay, I'm trying to build something over this dual elliptic curve. So here's my dual elliptic curve again. There's one point on here that's very special. This point corresponds to the trivial bundle, i.e. the holonomies of the associated flat bundle are both trivial. So in this case, G1, and G2 are both one. My pen stopped working, but I'm hoping it shows up soon. Yeah, okay, there we go. And in this case, the fixed locus of M super G is the entirety of S2. For every other bundle, if I'm doing an actual non-trivial rotation, the fixed locus of MG is just the pair of poles, the north and south pole right here. So in other words, I'm trying to glue together some sheaf over this space whose stock over one point is the equivariant cohomology of S2 and whose stock over every other point is the equivariant cohomology of two points. So there's some equivariance happening and let me not focus on it too much right now. I'll just say that the equivariance again gives you the structure over what's, as we discussed, a priori a polynomial ring in one variable but then you analytify it and somehow periodize it so that it glues together over this elliptic curve. But whatever else is going on over this elliptic curve, I expect to see somebody who's, uh, who's fiber over this point. I expect to have as many dimensions as the cohomology of S2, which is two dimensional. 
and whose fiber over all of these other points, I expect to see as many dimensions as the cohomology of this guy, which is again two dimensional. So you might expect that the answer in this case, elliptic u1 of s2, is some rank two vector bundle over this fellow right here, bun u of 1e. And that's right, that is the answer. You get some rank two vector bundle. So this was extremely sketchy and heuristic, but this is a reasonable guess and it is what you get. And you might ask, okay, is this an interesting rank two vector bundle or is it just something kind of, I mean, what, what is this? Somehow I've constructed a rank two vector bundle over an elliptic curve. I thought I knew what those were. What, what is this guy? All right, well, we can actually compute this. And the way to compute this is to claim that there's going to be some kind of Meyer Couture sequence. So I'll assert that and try to compute this sheaf uh, over this space bun U1E. So to apply my retorus, here's my sphere again. Here are the special points, the fixed points under the action. And I want to take a cover of it that's invariant under the group that's acting this rotation. So let me pick the usual cover of CP1 by the upper and lower, um, I don't know, whatever, complements of the north and south poles. So I'll draw it kind of like that. And the intersection is like this big cylinder here in the middle. And I claim that there's going to be some migratory sequence computing this sheaf out of the information of the corresponding sheaves of these three ingredients. So I claim that, so let's try to do a migratory computation. Try to do a migratory computation. So this guy right here, it is a copy of C inside CP1 and U of one is acting on it. U of one is acting on it. But C is, it, it's contractible, it contracts to a point and it contracts in a U1 equivariant way. So whatever this sheaf is right here, elliptic of C over U1, you might expect that to be the same as elliptic of point over U1, which we've computed. This sheaf right here is just going to be the structure sheaf over the base base one U of one. This thing also is going to be the structure sheaf, the part coming from the Southern hemisphere. And I claim that the way Meyer Vitoris works, uh, let's see, I, I'm, I'm going to take the kernel. It turns out there's no odd cohomology in this case, so it's a pretty short, long exact sequence. I'm going to, going to take the kernel of the map from the direct sum of these two guys to whatever this thing is. This thing, this copy of C star, contracts to just u of one, the equator itself. So I've got u of one acting by multiplication on, on u of one. That guy has no fixed locus unless I'm at the trivial bundle itself. So the sheaf that I get in this case is a skyscraper sheaf supported at just this trivial bundle. And in fact, it is just the skyscraper sheaf of a point there. So I get O of zero, where by zero, I mean the trivial bundle side here. So this, I claim, if you do Meyer Vitoris, you know, prove it and all that, this I claim is the sheaf elliptic U1 of S2. Okay, and breaking the symmetry a little bit, this is the same as the structure sheaf plus O of minus zero, that ideal sheaf. Or again, by zero, I mean the trivial bundle inside this moduli of bundles. So we've actually produced something interesting. This copy O of minus zero, uh, if you want, Tracing through this a little bit, you could equivalently think of this as something like the reduced equivariant elliptic cohomology of, or maybe, the, yeah, let's say the compactly supported equivariant cohomology of this copy of C with respect to U1. This is just if you like thinking about it that way, it's up to you. But we've produced an actual interesting sheaf over this uh, moduli of models. And the goal is to just keep having fun with that. Let's see what happens after. Okay, that was the more extended example that I want to do. Let me again pause and just see how people feel. So, so for other extended examples, so Jim and I were betting money for on the utility bundle. Money. Yes, uh, and we lost. Uh, but the but in retrospect, we, we knew we should have been wrong because over O we had to get uh, the trivial bundle. So, uh, but does that suggest that over other components, you picked one component, we're going to get 
other families are running two bundles. And depending on if we take an odd degree guy, we'll get something like the ATIA bundle or, uh, or what I mean. And also I can't help but say U1 is GM, as you said, and S2 is P1, the CP1 to all. Yeah, no, I mean, feel free, go ahead. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we never get non-trivial extensions actually. So maybe they're always direct sums of line bundles. Ah, I see, uh, right. So in this case, we have, yeah, we have a splitting, I think, because inside S2 mod U1, you could just consider this point sitting right there as the inclusion of point mod U1 into, uh, all right, sorry, S2 mod U1 or GM. Uh, and there's also a natural map back to point mod U1, just given by projection. So, uh, right. Once you apply this functor of equivariant elliptic cohomology, you get some sheaf, which as we talked about is the structure sheaf. Uh, it sits as therefore a direct sum and inside whatever this guy is. So this example is a little bit cheating. It's sort of a rank two vector bundle, but not really. It's always just going to be the structure sheaf plus some other line bundle. And that line bundle might be interesting. It was a little interesting. Oh, but, okay, but, but this is, still seems a useful example where in some sense you're saying it's like the real excitement of elliptic cohomology is not visible because you're not mixing these two. But even so, we see in the cohomology of a sphere, of, 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 we see the equivariant, we see like there's the point, we see the H naught and the H and the H2. You broke them into two pieces. One of them, there is the, uh, and so somehow looking at those two things, one of those two we should see is somehow the motive of the point. And one of them is a remnant of the motive of the affine line somehow. So if you did the same thing with P2, you might expect it to be a triple, some sort of triple thing. Right. So more generally, you could study something like, uh, yeah, G mod, B mod, B, like a, a Bruja type situation. And there you start getting interesting things. And let me not get into that story right now. Uh, but I'll briefly mention it for one reason later on. But yes, that's exactly the sort of game that people want you to play with this to construct interesting. Uh, algebraic sheaves. Now, this sort of this example does sort of hint. I mean, ordinary equivariant cohomology. Of course, we have the localization theorem that you know, up to maybe localizing the equivariant parameter. We do know that the cohomology of the of the two spheres equal the cohomology of the fixed points, and there seems to be a shadow of that here. So, is there a, a statement of localization for this kind of elliptic version? Right. So, good. Uh, okay, I mean, basically the answer is yes, but I think you have to be a bit careful, let me think. Y yeah, uh, the answer is going to be yes, but you, you're going to get these interesting twists by lines. And let me jump ahead to the rest of my talk, actually. Like, it's not gonna fully answer your question. No, this isn't like, oh, go away until later. No, like, I, I think this- but, 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 but Jim's question is, he's saying that, that that should come from the normal bundle. Like that, yeah, that twist. That, that's, exactly right. that, okay. that, that's what's going to happen. That that's the sort of game that we're going to be playing very shortly. Fair. This is, this is fun disrupting your talk. This is like getting it. This is great. This is interesting. Great. So, sure. yeah, no, it's super. Yeah. Did anyone add, yeah, did anyone figure out this question yet? I'm still curious about that. All right. So okay, here's this proposition slash definition, which is that this guy, which I define as an analytic sheaf, is actually the analytification of an algebraic sheaf. And claim it's an actually a quasi coherent sheaf. The quasi is there only if M is actually has infinitely much cohomology for any reasonable M. This is going to be a coherent sheaf of algebras on Bunchy. And technically, this guy is still graded, but I don't really care. That's why there's this, all this commutative differential graded stuff here, but I don't care about the grading. I'm going to, for this talk, especially, let me just restrict to the zeroth part of the, this whole graded object, which again, secretly, as we talked about before, really is about the entire even cohomology of the G equivariant cohomology of that. So that's what I'm remember, remember, remembering here. I've now got an actual coherent sheaf of algebras over the space and therefore I'm gonna consider a relative spec. So at the end of the day, out of the information of a compact Lie group acting on a G man, acting on a manifold, I've constructed, I claim, some scheme or more generally something over M11 if you like, and that is representable. Super. So now that this definition has like sort of been given, people immediately made many conjectures. In fact, they, some of these papers didn't even refer to them as conjectures, they just called them axioms as if, if you didn't manage to prove this, this was your fault, not mine. Uh, people made various conjectures about this structure. So here are two papers in particular that were very influential, namely by Ginsburg, Kronoff, and Bessero in the 90s, and then by Matt Ando in 2002. 
So in particular, you might recognize from these names that these guys were exactly interested in the structure for representation theoretic purposes. And they were exactly interested in applying it to the sorts of examples that Ravi and Jim were asking about, namely take the flag variety, take consider some interesting actions on it like Gmod B and consider the action of B on the left on that guy. And you can do various push pull type constructions with convolution uh, like Steinberg varieties that you build out of all that stuff. And they wanted to build elliptic heck algebras and elliptic quantum groups this way. So that's the most that I'll say about that whole strand of ideas, but that's exactly the sort of interesting examples that they wanted to get out of this. Um, and Ando was interested in this um, for different reasons. And now let me finally mention some motivation for why I've done any of this besides the representation theory. Uh, the other is that the way I think about this structure is as a categorification of certain manifold variants. Namely, cohomology or K theory you might consider as categorifications in a suitable sense of interesting manifold invariants like just the Euler characteristic or the a roof genus or the Todd genus. And those manifold invariants might be useful to actually classify manifolds. I'm not going to stop you from doing that. But more than that, they really have a life of their own. They really show up in concrete formulas when you want to do computations. For example, in Grothen and Greenland Rock, the Todd genus exactly shows up as the fudge factor when you want to compare pushing forward a sheep and taking its turn character to doing those operations in the opposite order. So there's something analogous here called the elliptic genus that has a life of its own and is an interesting invariant that shows up in concrete formulas. And this is a categorification that therefore people really wanted to study. And therefore there were a lot of axioms about this, uh, conjectures about this. In particular, here's one conjecture that I think appeared in this paper, but maybe was just implicit. So now I've, I've defined for you G acts on M, I've defined for you the scheme spec elliptic G M. And I, let me change, Point of, points of view now, and let me just talk about stacks on the side of smooth manifolds, which I might call C infinity stacks. But that's just terminology. If you're not happy with that, don't need, you don't need to worry about it. But suppose I've got two C infinity stacks that are actually equivalent to stacks. So suppose some M mod G is equivalent to some N mod H. Uh, then there should be some natural morphisms between the associated spec elliptic GM and the claim is that this should be a natural isomorphism of schemes. That's one of the basic structures that we would want out of this whole big thing that we've just finished building. This is the sort of thing that's pretty easy for equivariant cohomology, once you parse this, and it really doesn't seem easy for equivariant elliptic cohomology. You need to know something about the structures of all these fixed point sets and so on and so forth. So the uh, question that I asked in the pre-talk was exactly me grappling with how to start trying to figure out how to get some structure on these maps of stacks that aren't always induced in nice ways. And the answer to that question is yes, you set up your definitions appropriately. And that's one of the ways that you can try to attack this. I'll certainly not dwell on this now because it's sort of technical and just in the midst of the result that I want to get to. But for example, this is the sort of thing that you might like to establish. So the name of this talk was Matt, can I just sorry to bring up another point because I guess in, especially in this kind of example where you're talking about with the m mod g being isomorphic to n mod h, you might have something like g is a you might have one of them being finite and the other one being connected, right? Like g might be connected and h might be finite, but your whole theory doesn't doesn't look to me like it works for finite groups, and maybe this is at the heart of the problem. So, so far, nothing I said demanded that G be connected. I said, let G be a compact Lie group. I never said let G be connected. But like the Carton model and stuff, like it, all that stuff, if you have a finite group, all the cohomology is torsion and the Carton model really requires work over Q and you're killing all kinds of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'll be totally honest that I'm only working with vector spaces over C. I'm not, we're studying the integral cohomology right now. Right, so I think, I think there's some major problems when your group is not connected. I'm correctly computing the equivariant cohomology over C or the equivariant elliptic cohomology over C. If we, if we look at this guy, if G is finite, then this thing is just a point. And I'm literally just studying differential forms on M that are invariant under G. And what I'm going to compute is the cohomology of M invariance under G. That is the correct G equivariant cohomology of M if G is a finite group, at least over the complex numbers. So you're not disagreeing, but Jim is saying the definition is not rich enough. Or what is appropriate that there should yeah, be. Yeah, like maybe we equivalent. shouldn't be surprised then in, in when you've got an equivalence with the, like an M mod G and an N mod H and G is connected and H is finite that 
that this goes awry. I mean, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, no, this doesn't go awry. This is a true proposition that I've proved, even when genius. <laughs> <laughs> it's both true. so you have it's true and you've all, so you've proved it and it's also true okay yeah so. like they're they're two in one. <laughs> okay but no i i actually am very sympathetic to this because there's something more clever that you can do when g has component group and you can try building uh bungie e there, there's a natural reason to want to build it as not just the course moduli space you still need to take the course moduli space when you quotient by the g naught the connected component of g action but then you can take a stack equation when you further quotient by the pi naught of G action. And that's something interesting. And you can, it is reasonable to build elliptic GM as a sheaf over this stack. But then if you just take a naive relative spec, this goes awry. And I think there needs to be some way to fix it where instead of just taking a naive relative spec, I take some kind of root stack construction, but I decided, okay, this is a problem for the future. Let me not get too ahead of myself. Let me just try I mean, this, this commuting tuples up to conjugation is an orbifold, most naturally, right? Exactly. You, yeah, so you could be doing that orbifold stack. Whereas in algebraic geometry, it's it's the art, it's more of an artin thing. So I, I would stay on the differential geometry side and you get an actual orbifold. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And there, there, there is more to be learned here that I've decided not to touch just yet. But at, at the level of truncation that I'm doing right here, I am at least telling you true propositions. So, okay, that's worth something. Okay, uh, fine. So the title of this talk is Line Bundles in Equivariant Elliptic Cohomology, where now I can more precisely tell you what I mean. I've got these interesting schemes now, spec elliptic GNM, GM, and I'm going to construct some line bundles on them. And there's an interesting question about what's going on with the behavior of these line bundles and when they trivialize or not. So, okay. Suppose V is an oriented vector bundle now on one of these M mod G. So now I've totally switched to stacking notation and I'm just writing this. But again, this concretely just means I'm studying a G equivariant vector bundle on map. If you want to be even more stacky, you could just say a map of stacks. Okay, anyway. So suppose I have this. I'm going to define some guy that's a priori just a sheaf, but then I'll claim that it's a line bundle on this scheme spec elliptic GM. Okay, here we go. So V is some vector bundle over M that's also G equivariant. So I could consider the elliptic, the G equivariant elliptic cohomology of V and I, as a, some sort of module, a sheaf of modules over this sheaf of algebras, the G equivariant elliptic cohomology of M. To make this interesting, if I just did that, I would get nothing interesting because V would just immediately contract down to its zero section M and I would get literally the same thing. To make this a little more exciting, I'm going to put some condition here called compact support or if I'm really, I want compact vertical support of my Durham forms or whatever model you're thinking of in the vertical direction. Uh, and okay, that's the thing I can impose. And now that's the structure that makes this just a sheaf of modules over this space as opposed to a sheaf of algebra. In any case, I just do the same construction as before now with this compact support condition and I get a sheaf of modules. So therefore it gives me some coherent sheaf over spec elliptic GN. And I claim that this sheaf is in fact a line model. I, I can actually locally trivialize it and show that it's free of rank one. So fine. I'm not going to dwell for a long time on why this is a line bundle, except in one example that I'll give later in the remaining six minutes. It is. And if you've seen equivariant, if you've seen any sort of cohomological computations before, you might recognize that this line bundle, this Tom line as it's called, is extremely important because that the, the Tom line of the normal bundle is exactly the sort of information that shows up in the localization formula that Jim was referring to before. More generally, if I have any map of manifolds M to N, and I want to push forward the cohomology of M to the cohomology of N, you know that you can do this, for example, in ordinary cohomology if the fibers are oriented. More generally, if you're working in K theory, elliptic cohomology, or one of these other guys, you might wonder what the right condition is. And there's this trick due to Pontragon and Tom that makes that they figured out whenever they figured it out, which is you embed N inside a big vector space, which you can do by Whitney. And you can also embed N inside a vector space. And all that you really need to study is the, the information of whether you can, ex, of the information of the normal bundle of N inside the vector space that it's embedded inside and similarly for N. So whatever the information is, 
that tells you when you can push forward along a, ma a map of manifolds, it's embedded inside the triviality or non-triviality of these Tom lines. So this is an important line, but when people care a lot about whether it's trivial, here I've finally given you a definition and shortly I'll give you a hard conjecture in the subject that tells you when you should expect this line bundle to be trivial. So far so good? Okay, a couple nods here and there. Here's the conjecture. So this is due to Ando in that 2002 paper, which is that suppose I've got two bundles, V1 and V2 on some M mod G as above. There's a technical condition here that I wrote in purple, which is that he assumed that some characteristic classes vanish so that they both were in fact spin bundles. I think my proof works. I, I, I think the proof that I'm, I was planning a discussion but definitely won't now uh, works without that condition at all. But let me state it for now because there's more that I want to check just to make sure. And here's the crucial condition right here. So these are two bundles. Suppose there are first Pentragon classes as classes in the integral H4 of the stack M mod G or only the G equivalent co mod G bound. Suppose those two classes are equal. Or if you're if you like complex bundles better, which is totally reasonable, suppose that their first uh, that their second churn classes are equal. So this is a very mild condition on these two bundles. Out of all of their characteristic classes, I'm only imposing that their second churn classes are equal. Then he conjectures that these two Tom lines as line bundles on this equivariant elliptic scheme are in fact isomorphic. And there's some factor in green here that I'm not going to really comment on. It's tensor some factor of Hodge if you're working globally over the moduli of elliptic curves. So this is a conjecture and uh, Ando together with Greenlease and about 10 years later made some progress on this uh, where they checked the triviality of the line Tom V1 tensor Tom V2 inverse, kind of stockwise and a little bit more than that. But it's it's really been hard, I think, to try to show this globally. And it's somehow unclear how you would. The, this condition about these two bundles is so cheap, it's just one of their characteristic classes agree, that it's not it's not totally clear what to do. So the, okay, this is the question. And I've now stated this question for you, but I mean take a crack, see what you think. Why is this question important and why is it interesting? This condition of these two bundles having the same second churn class, the first Pentragon class, was discovered in many contexts, one by topologists trying to write down this uh, elliptic genus that I told you about uh, 30 minutes ago or so, and one also by physicists working with anomaly cancellation in some theory. They both figured out that this is a very reasonable condition to expect. And a priori, I don't think there's any reason, like I said, to expect this. Just if you write down all the structure, these lines look totally different from each other. And okay, that's why it's a hard conjecture. So in some sense, the, the gist of this talk that I wanted to portray is that this is a use of algebraic geometry to solve what seems like a pretty hard problem in some other field, which is exactly the sort of thing that I like doing because this was supposed to be an introduction to what I do as a, as a new member of the department, I guess. So there you go. All right. So this is now a theorem, and let's do one or two examples really quick. So first of all, for U of one acting on C as the standard representation, just rotating it, if I try considering the cohomology with compact support, that secretly is the sort of example that we did up before. The Tom line of this standard representation is exactly O of minus the zero section, the ideal sheet of the zero point inside the moduli of bundles. And I wrote it as some other thing over here that I may or may not have time to talk about. Uh, I'm not gonna have time to talk about that. Let me skip that unless someone asks later. So that was just a very brief introduction to one example of the calculation of the Tom line. It turned out to just be this interesting line O of minus zero. Let's now consider the um, stack point mod U1 cross U1 cross U1. So now over this, the infinity stack, I've got three universal complex line models that I'll denote as standard sub i for i running from one to three. And let me build these two vector bundles. Uh, one is the, take the tensor product of all of them and then add all three of them. So this is some rank four vector bundle, rank four complex bundle. And this guy is you take all the one, two, one, three, two, three, tensor them together, add those guys up. With some rank three complex bundle. If you want, you could add another copy of the trivial line here just to make them have the same rank. 
I claim that these two vector bundles, if you check, have this have the same second term class. So Ando is supposed to tell you that the Tom lines corresponding to these guys actually agree. Okay, what's the statement of Ando's conjecture? And by following along the same sorts of lines as the previous Tom line being O of minus zero, you find that in this case, we demand, we're demanding that the following divisors are rationally equivalent. Namely, just schematically, if I let PI be a point in the i elliptic curve as i runs from one to three, I could consider the divisor P1 plus P2 plus P3 equals zero, i.e. The, the divisor inside E times E times E given by the sum of the points being zero. Here are three other divisors given by zero cross E cross E, et cetera. There are three other divisors, and I'm claiming that these sums of divisors, that, that these divisors on both sides are rationally equivalent. Okay, that's a non-trivial claim. How do you show that? And I can think of two proofs that I'll leave for the Discord chat. Y'all come up with that. But the point is that this is, okay, it's not so hard to prove, but this is a non-trivial claim in algebraic geometry. And somehow what's going on in this conjecture is a much more global version of this claim. So this is the, right, this is the impetus of what's going on in this subject. And so, hopefully- it's so Are you saying, for example, that equality you have should also be true over somehow moduli of elliptic curves and that this is some relative theorem of the cube kind of thing. And so the topologists are actually uh, like these things which naturally on the topology turn out to be things which are really kind of subtle and cool. And I mean, like not, these are not like, these are like serious, interesting things. And, uh, that, and are there are higher things. I mean, presumably the topologists aren't done. And if you keep understanding what they do, they keep predicting these more interesting, complicated things. That's absolutely right. So as Robbie says, one way to see this quality of divisors, this isomorphism of line bundles is theorem of the cube. If you restrict to any E times E times zero, inside there, you see the equality of line bundles and therefore they're isomorphic over the whole guy. So whatever the topologists are doing is some global version of the theorem of the cube. And so this, this statement, this, you know, this conjecture, it wasn't yet proven. It, it, it needed proof. So somehow you got to give that, but the way that I, that, that, I think about this, like we eventually figured out how to prove this is not actually using the theorem of the cube. It's some different trivialization of this line. And what the topologists are, yeah. What the topologists are doing are giving at the very least some integral refinement of this theorem of the cube type of reasoning. And I think they're probably going to get interesting higher versions of theta function identities, this, this, sort, of, this sort of mathematics, but okay. This is not what I'm ready to tell you about right now. I, I'm ready to tell you about the proof of this theorem, uh, which is a global version of this, but okay. I don't think there was more that I wanted to tell you. That was basically the gist of the talk. And I think I'm just about at time anyway. So let me end it there. Thank you so much. That's good. Great. So let's unmute yourself and thank, thank Arnon for, for a great talk. And now we know we get to hear the topic of his next talk one year from today, where he will uh, continue with the higher versions of the theorem of the cube and the many theta function identities that will be proved by tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so we have, okay, great. We have time for questions. There's at least one that I want to hear asked from Discord, but uh, then I'll ask if Joachim doesn't, but if uh, uh, other, uh, yes, uh, maybe I will let me stop the recording so we can ask st even stupider questions. Uh,